Um, this is a School of Security Studies uh, sponsored seminar series, and um, this is the third year running. Um, the point of the series is to showcase the vibrant uh, um, and diverse research that our early career scholars and our PhD students are doing across the school. Um, so we've um, uh, you can find us on the War Studies YouTube channel for our previous um, uh, seminars and uh, yeah, and um, watch this space. We have much more coming up from um, um, after Ross's, but let's roll back. I'm super excited to have Dr. Ross Peel here today. And um, Ross is a research and knowledge transfer manager in the Department of War Studies and the Center for Science and Security Studies here at, at King's College London. Um, and Ross today is going to be talking about the very topical important discussion of the, the title of his presentation is A Different Kind of Nuclear Weapon, Ru uh, Russian Abuse of Ukraine Nuclear Power Plant. So this is no doubt going to be a very um, great conversation we have. Um, Ross today is uh, joined also by Professor Tracy German, who is a professor in conflict and security at the Defense Studies Department here at KCL. Uh, welcome you both. So glad to have you as part of the series. Um, so for you, the audience, what happens now is I'm going to hand over the virtual floor to Ross. He's going to present his um, working paper for about um, 20 minutes or so before Tracy offers some commentary discussion. And then we open it up to you, the audience, for uh, any um, feedback, comments, questions, a broader Q&A. You can either raise your Zoom hand to ask the question live, or you can pop it in the Q&A box and I will ask it to Ross. So without further ado, Ross, I'm gonna hand over the virtual floor to you. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Amanda, and great to be here and really happy to be able to share some thoughts and, and ideas about what's been going on about the nuclear power plant situation in, in Ukraine as part of this wider conflict. So this is, I'll, I'll caveat up front by saying this is all against the background of the wider international concerns and the, the potential at the mo that we're facing at the current moment for the fears around the escalation of this into a into a nuclear conflict um, but we have to also remind ourselves all the time when we're working on this and i'm always kind of very conscious of it that this is a real situation where a lot of people are are struggling and in, in great suffering and losing their lives every day and so it's important that whilst i'm focusing on um one specific aspect of this conflict to keep in mind that there's a much broader situation going on so with, with that said, allow me to just briefly introduce myself a little more. So um, I've been at King's now for about three and a half years in the Centre for Science and Security Studies. Prior to my time at King's, I was in the nuclear engineering technical sector in the, in, the, in the power plant side of the house. And so my work on warfare, international relations and so on is relatively new. And before that, I was 100% a hard science, technical engineering kind of person. So I'm hoping that as I bring the uh, that side of things to this discussion today, that Tracy will be able to support us with more of her Russia expertise and we'll be able to come together into a uh, to form something much more um, complete than I would alone be able to deliver. Um, but I'm doing a lot of current work on nuclear security and safeguards, uh, international risks of, of uh, exporting small modular reactors, what we call SMR, naval submarine reactor safeguards, and a whole range of other stuff as well. <clears throat> so what I'm going to be talking about during this is, first of all, what is the current situation in Ukraine with its nuclear power plants? the risks that are faced over there as a result of this and um, why people in the public as well as experts are concerned. I'm going to try to make some suggestions about why this has been happening in the first place. I want to touch on the use of disinformation by both sides in this conflict and finally try to maybe start suggesting what could be done about this to, um, to address it, to stop it happening again. So just briefly, uh, you'll see here, first of all, what we have in, term, in Ukraine in terms of nuclear facilities. Um, around half of Ukraine's electricity is provided by nuclear energy or was 
and this comes from 15 different reactors uh, which are at four sites and the most interesting ones for this discussion is Zaporizhia in the bottom right of this um, of this map that you see here where it has six reactors and this is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe as the as the media has been at pains to remind anyone who's reading the about this story um, we also had um, some activity at Chernobyl uh, the former nuclear power plant site, but um, this was more of a kind of temporary occupation, which which lasted only a few weeks. However, the situation at Zaporizhia is has been an occupation of the site, which has continued since the fourth of March. Now, whilst the plant has been occupied, it has still been operating. So uh, it's been operated by its Ukrainian staff under the supervision of uh, Russian experts from the state nuclear company Rosatom. And it has been um, also under the control of Russian military forces who've been um, securing the facility and, and um, making sure that it operates in, in line with their expectations, let's say. Now, over time, there's been some concerns about what's been going on there, primarily to do with the impacts on the, the personnel and the staff who work there, kind of working in, in the very stressful conditions, which is not great when you're supposed to be controlling a, a nuclear reactor and need to give your full concentration to it. Uh, and we've also seen a lot of accusations of the use of this facility as a Russian military base from which it can launch missiles and so on without fear of retribution by Ukrainian forces. Um, more recently than that, though, we've seen an increase in shelling of the plant, uh, and both sides blame each other for this shelling on, upon the nuclear facility, uh, with daily reports of new damage to the plant and new damage to the, um, to, for instance, the power lines that supply it, uh, and it supply, and through which it would normally transmit energy to Ukraine, but for most of the time now, which it receives power from other power plants in order to maintain uh, safety functions. Now, the biggest recent development was at the start of September, we had a visit from the International Atomic Energy Agency on their international support and assistance mission to Zaporizhia, the ISAMS mission. Um, and they conducted a few days of, of, um, of inspections and so on for a variety of different reasons. And they've left two staff behind who will remain there permanently on rotation with others. But um, the intention certainly is to have a permanent IAEA monitoring presence from the international community um, until this conflict is, is brought to some sort of conclusion one way or another. And to just put this um, geographically in the context of, of Russian forces, you'll see that the Zaporizhia power plant as indicated by this blue icon is um, now kind of right on the border and really has been for, for months, this situation, the front hasn't moved around the power plant although you can see that the there have been advances of ukraine recently um in the north around kharkiv and also um in the south around kherson we're kind of um anticipating that this front around the nuclear nuclear power plant may be a little slower to move um because of you know what might happen as russian forces are uh, put under pressure around that power plant we certainly don't want any any um dramatic and drastic action being taken there So what are the risks? Um, so I included an image at the front of this presentation of when I was kind of talking to the media and I've done a lot of talking to the media about risks um, on this. And the way I characterize it is in this way, that we're kind of, uh, there are two types of risk here. There are the direct risks that could result from shelling on the plant, which would cause damage uh, to the point where nuclear material can re be released. Um, and escape from the various layers of containment and steel and concrete that are put in place to prevent that if those were penetrated by shells and missiles. Or we're looking at indirect consequences because nuclear power plants, even when they're shut down, they don't immediately become inert and they need um, cooling water. And certainly in the case of this plant, it needs water to be passed through the reactor and through some uh, pools that in which the old used fuel is stored because the used fuel remains very hot for a long time. That cooling water passes through, takes the heat away and keeps everything um, nice and relatively cool. If we lose that access to that cooling water or the electricity to the pumps that supply it, either from off-site power plants or from diesel generators to produce that electricity on-site, then we're looking at a situation where the fuel will start to heat up 
uh, and potentially cause things like melting of that fuel, what we call the meltdown, or fires inside the reactor and so on, all of which though leads to this same thing, to this unacceptable radiological consequences, what, we, what is the term we use in the industry. Um, and effectively, this means a release of radiation that will cause public health consequences of a, severe, of a serious nature. And we're looking at the potential for a spreading, what we call a plume, a cloud effectively of nuclear material being carried by the wind, moving within Ukraine and, and potentially internationally in, in a lot of different directions, be that towards Europe, Africa, the Middle East, or even Russia. Uh, and the image I've shown, I've got at the bottom there is um, from a, it's from a media prediction of what might happen at Fukushima um, just about 11 years ago. So this is not a, um, a representation of, Zap of Ukraine, obviously, um, but this is one of the ideas of what plume can look like when radioactive material is transported um, by wind over great distances. So in terms of why this is happening, um, this is a question that I've kind of been, been asked a lot. Um, and for anyone who wants to kind of understand why Russia is keen to control this plant or what they have to gain here, there's not really a one solid concrete answer, unfortunately. Um, and, and as I, can all, I think we can all appreciate, trying to peer into the mind of Vladimir Putin and see what his intentions are is a bit like trying to read a crystal ball. But I'll try and make some suggestions here and, and look forward to hearing um, what Tracy might say as, as alternative explanations that I haven't thought of or perhaps where I've overstated something. Um, so we could be looking at a range of things. Something that's been talked about a lot is weaponization of energy in order to uh, use that energy in order to um, achieve various things to, to either power Russia and Ukraine or to deny access to energy to others. And this is in the context of a much wider debate around whether Russia is weaponizing energy against um, Western allies of Ukraine. Uh, we're looking at potentially is this a distraction tactic in order to pull a media and wider public attention away from the wider war and focuses on to nuclear power plants and certainly um, the media has a very strong in, um, desire to look at nuclear power and nuclear power risks rather than uh, the situation with, with what's going on on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis. Is this potentially a political or propaganda victory that Russia is seeking to win here by um, showing that it can control this very important strategic target? Or is it potentially to deprive Ukraine of energy? And this is going to be particularly important as we go into the winter months and in the context again of that wider energy shortage that, that we're facing globally at the moment. Um, is Ukraine, Russia hoping Ukraine will capitulate in the face of energy shortages in, in that bitter winter coming up? Um, military use of secure facilities, so using the facility as a, as a missile launch base and, and, and other military facility um, again, against which they know a, a, a Ukrainian response is fairly unlikely. Um, is it in order to push that energy uh, into Russia or control Crimea? Are we looking at potentially the acquisition of nuclear material for various purposes, either this, the theft of the nuclear fuel for use as nuclear fuel in Russia in the same type of reactors or uh, in a weapon? Is it possible that Russia is seeking to plant false flag evidence, um, quote, evidence of a Ukrainian nuclear weapons program, something they've claimed exists in the past? Um, and so they're looking to put something in that plant that will lend credence to that claim. Is the plant to be used as a new kind of nuclear weapon? Is it intended that under certain circumstances and conditions, they might choose to purposefully cause this, this unacceptable radiological consequence? Is it something that they have, um, they have taken control of this plant and want to use that as a way of legitimizing their presence? Because if they can control all these strategic assets and things, does that kind of give them a some sort of de facto legitimization of Russian control? Or finally, is this, is this, was this an accidental acquisition on the east bank of the Dnieper River? Um, they've managed to acquire this as a result of pushing the front lines to the river, and now they can't simply withdraw and leave this vulnerable strategic point um, unguarded. So a whole range of potential possibilities there. And 
I'm, I'm suggesting things with no um, particular leanings towards one theory or the other on this slide. I'm simply kind of laying out a whole range of possibilities. One thing I will say is that these may have changed dramatically over time. Um, you know, they were, they were, the Russian forces were moving that way very quickly at the start of the war. And we're also pushing towards the South Ukraine uh, nuclear power plant. So moving up towards uh, this other facility, if I go back a few, uh, a few more, moving up past Mykolaiv and up to this, this South Ukraine nuclear power plant. That was a front that we saw emerging before the war kind of, um, the, the Russian advance ground to a halt. So all of these different possibilities out there and we're not really sure which one it is. Um, now, disinformation is a key point for me and we've seen in this conflict, both sides blaming the other for the shelling that is taking place at the plant. Um, so Ukraine has been ma repeatedly made the claims that it's Russia perpetrating this shelling for various reasons. And the same Russia has claimed that, that it's Ukrainian um, nationalists or terrorist groups who or who are perpetrating the shelling and and both are blaming the other and claiming that well wh why would we shell the plant we have things to lose russia is saying we would shell our, we would be shelling our own soldiers um although this this claim for me has limited weight given how much uh, the reports of how much russian conscripts are struggling even in, within their own country at the moment um whether or not the, the Russia would be willing to sacrifice a, a few of its own soldiers is, is a point I'm speculating about in order to uh, uphold this narrative. Uh, and Ukraine is, is equally saying, well, why would we shell our own plants with our own people inside of it? It makes no sense. Now, this is muddied because in this conflict, we've seen demonstrably false claims from, from both sides. <clears throat> um, and the Russian ones, I think, are well known to most people. The, the Ukrainian ones, perhaps not so well known, but we saw one recently where um, Ukrainian strategic command was put on Twitter, was um, putting out a, a supposed screen grab from a Russian general saying that he would rather destroy the plant than, and, and blow it up than let it fall back into Ukrainian hands. And this was demonstrated to be false later on. So no one has the, the real high ground here. Um, one of the, the wider issues, of course, we have as well is the possibility that Russia has, um, to use the phrase, painted itself into a corner. It can't now back down from this invasion and, and from its occupation of the plant uh, without losing face because it's gone in there with a, with a certain mission and a certain set of objectives that it has claimed. And um, now to kind of leave would be to, to admit that it's either failed or to try and create a narrative to say those objectives have been achieved, which will be quite difficult. And what we've seen um, in the wake of that ISAM's visit as well and the, and the report that came from it was a lot of pressure from Russia on the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, to, um, to, to, to print in its report the claims Russia has made. And, and Russia is saying, you know, we have told you that the, the shelling has come from Ukraine, so why aren't you putting that into your report? Um, and the IAEA is always is very, very keen to avoid getting putting into its reports anything that it doesn't substantiate itself and anything that could be um, politically motivated. And it always is very, very careful to remain a completely neutral, unbiased organization that reports purely on the basis of, of observable fact. So in terms of the latest situation on the ground, uh, and this is a rapidly evolving situation, so it's very hard to kind of come to a conclusion on this or provide a much detail, but the, the latest situation we're seeing is that the plants have been until recently in cold shutdown, which is they've been shut down and brought to a state where the, the risks of a nuclear release are lowered. It doesn't mean they are uh, cold at room temperature, but more than like they're at 93 degrees, I think is the correct temperature. Um, <clears throat> So this increases their safety situation, but it also means that they can't generate any of their own electricity to supply their own safety functions. And so they're dependent fully on getting power from offsite and on, their, on the emergency backup diesel generators in order to provide their own energy. There have been uh, suggestions that unfortunately, because the power lines have, after a period of, of being let off for a few days, let's say they're now being shelled again, 
and the and they um, are now endangered again. So we're seeing the plants starting to consider: do we need to start back up in order to provide put us put ourselves in a potentially more risky situation, but in order to have another safety backup, uh, which will help us be be safer in another way. Um, the annexation of several regions of Russia following these um, sham referenda is a great concern um, because now Russia is saying effectively to the people at the plant, well, this is ours now, you're all going to have to reapply for your own jobs. And um, something we've seen coming from this most, most recently is the capture and detainment of the directors of the plant. So the director a couple of weeks ago uh, was kidnapped for a few days and released a few days later. Details of what happened to him in that time I haven't been able to find, but he has since stepped down from his position as director. And just in the last 24 hours, we've seen the, the deputy director of the plant has been kidnapped as well. I've seen suggestions, this is in order to, to interrogate them, in order to gain information on how they can um, uh, force the plant staff in order to, to leave and hand over control, but that's only a suggestion I've seen by someone that's not got any evidence that I've seen to back it up. And so the, the main point that I want to talk about, though, in terms of research going forward, really, is what can the international community do? Um, and this is at two levels. What can we do about Zaporizhia and the situation now? And this ranges from providing additional support to the IEA, IAEA and condemning any actions that might be taken by others that would raise the threat. Um, so actions by primarily Ukrainian and Russian forces that would raise the threat of what is going on there. The IAEA certainly wants to lower the temperature around the plant. Um, encouraging compliance with international law. So for instance, um, specifically the, the paragraphs of the Geneva Convention amendments, which say you should not attack um, facilities that contain what they call dangerous forces and by which they mean nuclear power plants and, um, and, and dams that hold back large bodies of water because damaging these facilities would have widespread impacts um, that are not uh, limited to just military, con uh, military consequences. And, and encourage further verification. So support the IAEA in its mission to go out there and report on, on the ground truth of what is happening. And more widely than that, to find out really what's going on, what is the origin of this shelling and, and put beyond doubt who is responsible for this, if it, whichever side it may be. Looking longer term as well, we need to think about how to prevent recurrence. And this involves reviewing from an international relations and other perspectives, how we got here what led to this conflict and what led to um, a nuclear power plant being made a, a considered a reasonable target. Uh, thinking about how we can improve international law and, and potentially take other measures um, that will prevent a recurrence of this, given that not everybody holds international law in the same regard. And then also to think about uh, nuclear security. So it's not reasonable in my opinion, and I, I'm not really in the opinion of anybody in the nuclear sector I've talked about to say, well, it's now up to you to figure out how to respond to a hostile invasion, because it would be unreasonable to expect them to hold that off if the national army can't defend a country. But um, to think about what what is the correct appropriate response if you are attacked, is it to shut down the plant and hand it over? Is that the correct thing to do? As as difficult as that might be, and, and it certainly would be for Ukraine. Um, what do you do about the spent fuel, given that you can't, you, whilst you might be able to shut down the reactor, there will still be a large amount of nuclear fuel on that site that needs safety functions ensuring over it to keep it cool and prevent damage and danger. And is the solution, as some have argued, the movement to mobile, transportable or floating nuclear power plants, which would be able to effectively um, lift up the anchor, as it were, and, and sail away in the case of conflict? Is that a solution where these things can retreat, but does it also place them at greater risk of easy hijack and theft or, or taking over by foreign forces? Um, and moving towards a point where we're learning safety and security lessons from this. So making sure that we're getting security and safety risks as low as is reasonably practicable and thinking about how governments can ensure the, the other area of reasonable. So going beyond reasonable and ensuring against these threats that are beyond the reasonable request of a nuclear power plant or nuclear power plant operator to manage. So 
a, a few words in conclusion though um is really we need to be from my point of view is thinking about how we can balance the need for a a just green energy transition uh, and desire to spread the benefits of people peaceful nuclear technology against the threat landscape of out there because if we're moving from a position where the threat landscape is no longer terrorists and organized crime gangs but includes foreign military invasions how can we and how can we ensure that we are operating to provide safety and security um, at nuclear power plants such that nuclear energy can play a vital role in that just green energy transition and that is very difficult given that even within my lifetime we've seen the cold war end in quotes and we've gone through huge train changes in international relations and and issues and tensions but a nuclear power plant is designed to operate for 40 to 60 plus years so how can you design today a system that is able to, to address all of the uncertain threats of the future can we justify continued use of nuclear energy in this new threat environment and I, I certainly hope so because i'm a big proponent of nuclear energy but we have to be objective which is hard given the ambitions of many countries so weighing the risks and benefits in an uncertain future is incredibly difficult and the decision on energy policy is of course a matter for an individual state and all of this again i would place in that context of well we've depart we, as Western Europe and beyond, we've designed, depended for many years on Russian fossil fuels to supply our energy needs. We, so we need to avoid trying to have a fossil fuel fix to this. We need to stop thinking about, well, the solution to this is to go back to fossil fuels and instead treat this threat as an opportunity to make a positive transition towards more green energy in a way that is safe and secure for all. And I'll stop there. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Ross. Um, a couple of thoughts from me there. And actually, I'm going to start with your final points there about the safety of, of nuclear power and nuclear power plants moving forwards as, as part of our kind of green energy transition. Because when you look at Russia's actions in Ukraine, but also what their thinking has been with regards to warfare in the 21st century and this sense of attacking critical national infrastructure, nuclear power plants obviously form a key part of our critical national infrastructure and are therefore key targets. And, and that then brings me on to, you know, my point, you, you were talking there about the why, why Russia is targeted, mm. why it's seeking to control it. Um, and I think I agreed with all of your points on that round circle, but I, I wrote down this kind of essentially the broad overarching aim is to undermine the will to resist of both Ukraine, the Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian people, but also I think more critically those outside of Ukraine. Um, so supporters in the West and elsewhere because a nuclear power plant holding that to ransom essentially has such big implications, doesn't it? That threat of attack and your slide with the risks, the direct and indirect risks, I think brought that home very, very clearly. That one of the reasons I think Russia has focused on this is very much about the fact that there are no borders if something happens, um, as, as we saw obviously with Chernobyl. In, in the 1980s. Um, so yeah, I would absolutely agree with all of your points and just leading up to that broader overarching, well, undermining the will to resist. You also talked about, um, towards the end there, about um, law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, and how what Russia's doing violates it. And I think that's a key point moving forwards because the last thing that we want to see is a repetition of this um, in the future. Um, and and you know, the, the fact that there would be no discrimination between combatants and non-combatants if something were to happen um, and some kind of either strike or accident which led to some kind of release from this power plant is, is going to be very, very indiscriminate, isn't it? Um, and not proportional. Um, in terms of the law of armed conflict, 
this is going to have a very, very significant impact. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very, it's a really interesting aspect, um, not just of, of this conflict, but of war in general, um, and how these installations should be being protected um, and are, are not, um, because they are, you know, they can be used as is in this case to such great effect. Um, and I thought you made the case, particularly um, the, the, the coming winter of depriving Ukraine of energy um, moving forwards. I think seeking, Moscow really seeking to take a, a longer term kind of view. Uh, and I'm less convinced that, that the one point I'm less convinced that is that it's, they found themselves accidentally um, mm -hmm. in charge of this one. Um, I, I, most of uh, you know their actions I think have thought behind them um, in terms of holding on to this um, particular asset and I I'm less convinced by the um, the accidental um, mm. holding of it um, but otherwise yeah absolutely I would fundamentally agree with with all of your points there yeah the the, the point about accidental I think is also undermined by I, I remember in late february early march watching this very narrow spike travel up towards south ukraine nuclear power plant and there was some theories that they were going to then sweep southwards down towards odessa and and i was kind of thinking they seem to me to be beelining straight for this second nuclear power plant so um and, and then when that kind of halted and, and got cut off i was you know deeply relieved but it still hasn't obviously prevented a complete um takeover of zaporizhia um and yes i agree that I don't think they've been left accidentally holding this one. I think it's, um, I think it's correct what you say. I'm just trying to present, I guess, all of the options. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and I think when we look at, you know, what Russian military scholars have been writing about, you know, warfare in the 21st century for the last, I don't know, the last decade or so, the lessons that they've learned. Um, from watching others and, and, and their own action is that, you know, it's not necessarily about seizing and holding territory. It's about trying to destroy a state's or an actor's economic potential. It's about mm. going for regime change. It's about being able to, to coerce, to pressurize um, without necessarily having to hold a wide territory. And I think the nuclear power plant in this case offers some of those options yeah, I would agree. Um, I'm going to ask probably a really naive question because I'm not an expert in um, this topic at all. But you know, just as uh, as a you know, as someone who's watching the news and who's interested and also has some interest and in, um, and some expertise in 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 war uh, and warfare, I just. This is just for me another example of how how we understand and organize ourselves in global politics just does not seem fit for purpose. Um, again, right? Um, the idea of kind of the the state, like um, Tracy was saying, you know, it's it's not about well, it is in this case there is territory, right? But it's so much more, and this nuclear um, power plant is such a great example of this, right? Example of the ways in which um, powerful people or powerful forces undermine global politics, not through acquisition of territory per se, but through economics, through environmental, through all of these migration, all of these different things that defy our very nation state kind of borders. And I just wonder for, you, Ross, I mean, you've reflected upon some things about what the international community can do, but I just feel like we're in this bind, we're like strengthen these laws, but these laws, again, are underpinned by this understanding of this autonomous nation state actor, right? And I just, I wonder if you've reflected in your own research, can, can we be a bit more creative or imaginary or visionary of how we can think about our global order that actually can, you know, address or respond to these they're not even emerging security issues anymore they've been enduring right they've been around mm. for a while so i just wonder if you 
have you reflected upon that or can you reflect upon that at all yeah i'll i'll provide a so so this this is as i kind of try to suggest at the beginning a little all a little new to me this idea of thinking in terms of ir theories and scholarship and and international law and all the rest of it and i'm still kind of working hard to get to grips with all of this so i'm I, i'm prefacing all, all with that to kind of say that if i say something naive or a bit off then that's why um but i was having a, a conversation yesterday with um a colleague of mine amelie sturzel who's going to be giving one of the presentations in this series later about international law actually um and and she and i mainly she are working on a um an outline for a conference at the moment where we're kind of saying um have we in western europe and, and this conference is particularly about germany become overly enamored of um, constructivism and post-structuralism and all these things and we operate on the basis of an international order where everybody comes together and and has all these organizations with rules and laws and all the rest of it and and we see realism almost as a kind of thing of yesterday and the past where um, you know we don't do that anymore we've had war over here and we didn't like it so we've decided that that war won't can't happen again in europe um, and have we become so deeply ingrained with that that um, we've lost sight of the fact that for for other states not that far away realism is still absolutely the um, you know the currency of choice or or, or what have you. Um, if the world is still viewed in that way by others, then it doesn't matter how we view it. If others with whom we we have to coexist view it very differently, um, so. I think there needs to be kind of a, as exactly as you say, all those laws and things don't necessarily matter to others in the way they matter to us. And so I don't necessarily have a solution or a proposition or an idea of something we can do instead. Um, but I think at least we need to recognize that others just don't care about these things the same way that perhaps we might do. I mean, I also think, and, and, and Tracy would probably weigh in on this as well too, but there's, I mean, it's also understanding um, what motivates Putin, right? Mm -hmm. That would um, enable, you know, why he is um, escalating things or making particular decisions, and 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 appreciating that is not something that's you know dismissive or he should just follow rule of order, but you know, or mm -hmm. rule of law. But you know, there's a there's like a, a hurt empire, a claim for a reimagining of, you know, the Soviet Union. And, um, and I mean, Tracy, it'd be great for you to weigh in on that too. But I think, you know, from my own gender expertise, and I'm just thinking, I'm like, this, there's such a need to not lose face and to appear powerful, right? And yeah. a force to be reckoned with. And in, unless, I see it from, you know, a gender lens, unless he's given some sort of way out, right, or some sort of way to save face um, from the from the West, per se, you know, we're in this perpetual bind of escalation, but it'd be great, you know, Tracy, for you to weigh in about, you know, does the imagining of empire play into this or, a, you know, or a, what do you think is motivating Putin? Um, I think uh, this sense of status definitely weighs heavy and has done for you know many many years and most of the time that Putin has been in power uh, this sense that Russia had not been has not been treated as a great power which is how Putin and those around him perceive the country to to be that particularly the United States treated it with, with disrespect um, and this sense of growing US unilateralism, um, particularly in, in, in the early 2000s, um, the withdrawal from um, the ABM treaty, for example, um, and this sense that the US was going about its business, doing you know what it wanted to do on the international stage without consulting others um, and from Putin's perspective this sense that you know we as a great power i.e Russia we should be consulted we we should have a voice on all of these things um, and you talked about empire there and, and I think you know, there's two issues with that I think Russia 
as a, a former imperial power is unusual because it, it, its borders remain contiguous with you know those those territories that used to be part of the Soviet Empire and then obviously the Russian Empire before that. But but also this sense that Russia as a great power should have spheres of influence where its interests are prioritized over those of others and you know that sphere of influence according to, to those you know in the Kremlin those, the Russian security elites is essentially the, the post-Soviet space and I think that is you know when we look at Russian foreign policy behavior over you know the last decade or, or more actually we can see that kind of these these status anxieties, this desire to be recognized as a great power, um, but also deep anger that it's not being treated as one. We've um, got some questions for you, Ross. Um, so uh, someone has, um, just an anonymous person has said, do you think that the situation will push the EU towards using nuclear energy? And do you think that seeing how quickly events are unraveling, this moving to nuclear energy is the only solution to utterly complete a green transition for a more sustainable future? Uh, and then the second question, how much do you think this change would be possible if the EU, given how important the disagreements between countries are on this kind of energy is? Okay, um, let me just reopen that so I can see the first question again. Um, so I, I, I've seen quite a few countries expressing interest in nuclear energy as a result of this and a renewed interest in it. Um, it's, so, so when you look across the EU, you see hugely different v views on nuclear energy, um, hugely different histories of nuclear energy based on, uh, you know, many years ranging from, um, for instance, Austria, which is completely opposed and has regularly put in place um, legal challenges to the use in, of nuclear energy in other countries where it sees this as, uh, as opposed to EU law. Um, so, for instance, when we had a competition in the UK where we were kind of talking about government support towards new nuclear power plants, Austria opposed that in the EU courts. Uh, and I think it only kind of got resolved in a, in a Brexit situation, effectively. Um, similarly, Germany has has sought to exit from nuclear power um, and, and wasn't keen on nuclear power even before Fukushima. But when Fukushima came along, it was a good trigger to, to really be able to get out of it. Um, other places like the UK, for instance, we've been more kind of um, allowing things to gently slip away. Um, and there's a there's a great book on the history of nuclear in the UK where one of the chapter titles is Years of Hope and Disappointment. And I think that sums up the way things have gone in the UK quite well. Um, however, to the question, the change now we're seeing is that a lot of countries are starting to, to really go in for this. The UK was already on a path towards new nuclear um, and has really leapt upon that now and i'm expecting by the end of this year actually some big announcements from from government and rolls royce about new stuff going off um, germany is engaged in some kind of debate about whether or not to prolong the life of its existing nuclear power plants and there are voices saying we should bring back online the older ones that were shut down early for no good reason um, and 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 various other places as well in terms of is this the solution for Europe, I think what we really probably will need is an is an all options solution. Um, my personal preference would be to see as little fossil fuel as part of that as possible. Um, I think there's still in a lot of quarters a desire to see it as a, as a war between nucle nuclear and you know, nuclear and, and fossils and then renewables, these three sides. And I think what really needs to happen is we need to embrace the the, the kind of coming together of, of renewable energy and nuclear power to kind of complement each other in order to really be, be beneficial. Is that possible within the EU, given these disagreements? I, I think it is possible and I think it is starting to happen, but different countries will have different different views on that um, but I do think it's the best and possibly only way towards probably only way towards a green transition towards and, and an ecologically just green transition 
Great. Okay. Next question is from Henry, uh, Henrietta Wilson. And she says, hello. Thank you everyone for a really interesting and useful session. Um, Ross uh, just wants you to say something about Ukraine's disinformation, anything that you're aware of, and are there particular themes of this disinformation um, and the ways it might be being challenged? I was. I knew somebody had asked me this. Um, so I've. It, it's difficult because I've been kind of following this issue in a. Um, I don't have any funding to do this, but I'm really interested, so I'm keeping an eye on the on the side kind of way, <laughs> for the last six months, or so, and uh, therefore I don't have a a kind of document to draw on with all these examples. Sadly, otherwise I would have, you know, potentially had something more documented. Um, so. I cited that one particular example of something being attributed to a to a Russian general saying that he would it was kind of a if we can't have it nobody can attitude towards the power plant. Um, there have been other things I've seen as well claims about um, kind of Russia doing this Russia doing that um, that have been very difficult to substantiate to the point where it is slightly um, suspicious, let's say. Um, that's not to say that there haven't been a lot of other things coming back the other way from the Russian side, where there've been a lot of claims that have been very difficult to substantiate. And um, I, I would say many of the Russian claims seem frankly implausible, if I may. Um, but um, what else have we seen from, from the Ukrainian side? <clears throat> It's I don't have any any proper examples for you, Henrietta, I'm afraid at this point, but perhaps we can um, pick up this conversation later um, and I'll try to d pull a few things out. Did that answer the question in full? I, I think it probably did. Oh, we have, um, yes, you just said thank you. So um, okay. that's fine with that. Um, oh, and, and the last point was, is it being challenged? And I did not see... Um, that it's being challenged. I haven't seen kind of anyone challenging this. I mean, it's it's possibly being challenged by Russia, um, but I haven't been kind of following Russia's uh, side of this very as as diligently. So I'm not so sure if that has or not. But I suspect it probably has. And and that claim about the um, the Russian general actually was um, debunked by by Western uh, sources. They were the one who were kind of coming along and saying this doesn't make sense and. Uh, and all that kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you have um, another question that popped in by Ronald. It says, thanks for an excellent presentation. Um, if the power plant goes out of control, what happens next? Is there another Chernobyl type disaster? Um, I laugh very awkwardly and nervously at that. <laughs> um, made uh, worse because of concrete um, scattered coffee can't be built. Second question, will it be equivalent to another kind of nuclear weapon? Um, and a 10 MT tactical weapon, strategic warhead, uh, what is the effect in military terms? Okay, great question. Thank you. So um, if it does go out of control and we are looking at, um, let, let's say worst case. So the worst case is kind of that combination of um, direct and indirect means I mentioned before. So seeing in parallel military strike that breaks open the uh, one or more of the reactors in combination with no ability to, to cool it. Um, and, and in the worst, worst case, then we're looking at something like something like what happened at Fukushima, where the, the biggest issue was not only is this thing exposed to the air, but because of the huge disruptions to all the logistical communication, transport, everything around, then you couldn't get anybody in to do anything about it um, very easily. So um, just going back to this. So if, if you are in that situation, then you're looking at potentially that, that plume of radioactive material, which might be you know, ranging in, in size from in and intensity from very little all the way up to fairly catastrophic. And I know there's a, those are fairly qualitative terms. Um, so that that's the, the worst possibility really is that release of radioactive material that travels on the wind potentially to great distances and then is deposited down onto the ground. Um, in that case, we'll be looking at advising people to to remain indoors and, and avoid 
going out and that kind of thing. But you could see consequences as we saw at great distance, as we did in, in Chernobyl uh, or post Chernobyl, where even in the UK, we saw stuff falling on uh, radioactive material falling on the grass, the sheep eating the grass, and then those sheep no longer being uh, able to be to be used in the food chain and that kind of thing. More close to Ukraine, obviously, then you're going to see much more severe effects because these things are always worse close to the source. So you might see um, potential evacuations of, of people and that kind of thing. Um, with evacuations, I must caution because it's been shown repeatedly that actually the impact on Fukushima survivors who were evacuated was far worse for them in terms of psychological um, impact than it would have been had they remained in place and just accepted a very, very low dose of radiation. So evacuation is certainly not the immediate solution. <laughs> Remain indoors for 6,000 years. Um, no, so until this sort of thing, is, until it effectively comes down out of the atmosphere and is rained down onto the ground, at which point it's um, much harder to, to breathe in and to, be, and to get it on your skin and that kind of thing. Um, but at, F at Fukushima, for instance, people were evacuated and then they spent quite a lot of time scraping up the ground, scraping up all the layers and that kind of thing off the surface. So um, this is, you know, the, the, I'm kind of cutting across multiple timelines and solutions here, but I can talk about this more if time allows. <clears throat> I just want, I, I don't want to um, spend ages on it in case there's other stuff that comes in, but I will come back to this if we want if there's time at the end. Yeah. Uh, second question, will it be equivalent to what kind of nuclear weapon? Uh, very difficult to say anything from very small up to, you know, not, not severe because the explosion part of it doesn't occur. We're not talking about a nuclear explosion where you're seeing a huge fireball of devastation rain out from the middle. It's more about the, the fallout portion of your nuclear explosion. So the sprinkling of nuclear material in, in low concentrations over a wide area and the potential impacts of that. Um, and I, I can't put a equivalent megatonnage, if you like, on it um, because you, you just don't know the intensity and, and even modeling you know the amount of fallout that will come from a from a different size nuclear weapon is is very dependent on a lot of factors. You got another question that came in, Ross. I think everyone's really interested, um, you know, in in the implications of. Yep. Yeah. So um, Stuart asked, Russia's activity surrounding the plant seems dangerous, calculated rather than accidental, and fits the bill of hybrid warfare when considered with other activity. Are Western analysts understanding Moscow's ambition and intent surrounding the seizure of the plant, noting Russia's propensity for risk and the psychological damage this could cause NATO members? Wow. Okay. Um, Easy question, right? Yeah, I know, right? It's it's that whole thing again of um, can you peer into the mind of Putin? Um, <clears throat> so, are Western analysts understating Mon Moscow's ambitions and intent? Um, well, I'll, I'll say again when I'm kind of mentioning accidental, I'm mentioning that very much as a um, as a possibility, as an option, uh, amongst many others, as a theory of what, what could be the motivation here and so on. Um, so, uh, and I'm not necessarily putting that forward as, as the answer, it was more of a possibility. Um, are Western analysts understating Moscow's ambitions and intent? Um, I think per, potentially in public, they are. Um, I think that we're kind of, I've not seen much public statements on the why and, and the what are they hoping to achieve and, and this kind of thing. Um, and that might be purposeful in order to avoid creating public panic because people are, are very afraid and, and, you know, to some extent rightly of nuclear power and, and the potential impact that could result from something like this. Um, in private, I suspect they are probably more uh, more concerned about this. Um, I know that I, for instance, when I've done media stuff on this, have to be very careful when I'm asked about, is this going to happen? Is this going to blow up? Are we all going to be, be harmed and that kind of thing? Um, bu -bu 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 -bum. I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm just reflecting on your question for a moment. Give me a second. Yeah, so 
this other point about um, Russia's propensity for risk is very, very interesting. And I think it was something I kind of maybe hinted at in my talk without stating outright is um, I, 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 from the, the reading I've done and, you know, which isn't wide or detailed because I don't have a great experience in Russia, but it does seem to kind of indicate that in Putin's mind, there's there's a thing called Russia, which is, you know, perfect and virgin and must be preserved and protected at all cost. And there are these other things that live in it called Russians, which are um, very much acceptable as sacrificial lambs in order to, pr to protect the wider Russia. Um, and I think sometimes we don't necessarily appreciate that because we look at it from our own perspectives, whereby we don't necessarily view the citizens of our own countries in, in the West uh, more, more often in that way as um, people who are should be happy to give their lives in order to protect the nation state in, in all circumstances and, and, it's, and that it's our right as experts or leaders or technocrats or whatever you want to call um, people in charge, let's say, or people who have power, um, in, in, you know, we don't view them as having the right to decide that for us, that we should go out and give our lives for something. Um, so, yeah, Russia's propensity for risk, I think, in this is something that is perhaps not as well considered as it should be. I've said repeatedly that I don't think they are going to purposefully damage this thing to the point where it causes a massive release of radiation. Um, and that is partly motivated by the fact that I don't think they would want to take that risk of that cloud drifting instead of in a in a Europe direction, in a Russia direction. But it's it's I, I'm always very careful to try and put any numbers on that or to to state how likely I think that is because it's very impossible. It, well, not impossible. It's very, very difficult to say. And I think any calculation of it would probably be wrong. <laughs> but I'll stop there. I mean, these are certainly lively and really important conversations. And yeah, I mean, me not being a, a Russian expert or a Putin expert at all, I, there's some decisions it appears that he's made or been responsible for that has made me step back. And yeah, you do have to, I think, key to all of this. And like you said, it's also an impossible task is trying to really understand the motivations. Um, and maybe again, um, Tracy, in the last like minute, we'd ask you to reflect upon, I guess, Stuart's question there too. Um, yeah, I, I, I was, I think probably Putin, the, the Russian security elites, have very much probably correctly assessed Western appetites or not um, for any kind of risk. And, you know, we, I think Ross, I mean, both during his presentation, but also in answer to the last question, really brought home the dangers surrounding um, this, this particular power plant, but nuclear power plants in war on, on battlefields in general. Um, and my sense is that, yeah, I, I'd agree with Stuart, this is probably calculated um, from the Kremlin. Um, I'm not a fan of the term hybrid warfare. I think this is warfare. Uh, this is a state using all, all means at its disposal to achieve what it wants to achieve. Um, and, you know, this sense of, I go back to this you know, seeking to threaten and intimidate not just the Ukrainians, seeking to undermine their will to resist, not just them, but all of those around um, that are supporting Ukraine. I think this the, what's happening at the power plant um, kind of fits that model. Um, but it's incredibly uncheery discussion. Yeah, on that bleak note, I mean, yeah, I um, it, I don't even know. I'm left speechless too. <laughs> so you watch kind of the news unfold and um, and and particular and uh, yeah, Ross, you're right. There's this the reflection of real politic, 
Um, but I think us who are interested in international relations more broadly and war more specifically and broadly, um, I think need to use a multiple theories and um, perspectives at, as a tool kit to understand, because I'm, I don't think it's ever just one theory, right? And one totalizing theory or perspective. And, um, you know, uh, Putin and uh, Western forces are illuminating this and making this very clear, right? You can see different strategies. Um, yeah, Tracy, I agree with you about the hybrid warfare. This is just multiple tools that um, you know, Russia in particular is using. Um, and you see other states, other state actors using multiple tools as well for um, to increase their sphere of influence and to be heard, um, you know, in the in the world world stage, right? And it's it's um, you know, it's it's not new um that you know, people or states who feel like they've had a marginal status will resort to violence, extreme forms of violence often to finally be heard, to be finally listened to. And so this also makes, I think, us as scholars um, and practitioners to reflect upon, again, is our, our systems and structures of world order fit for purpose, right? Um, and, you know, if the, if the point or the hope is to avoid escalation, violence, and war, is it fit for purpose? So these are just broader questions for us to, you know, reflect upon us as scholars and those interested in, in global politics more broadly. Um, I want to thank you, Tracy and Ross for, Ross for presenting something so brilliant um, and important and timely and raising these sobering questions. And for you, Tracy, for weighing in on your expertise and further sober analysis of, you know, um, where we go from here and how we might get out of this situation. These are, I guess, ongoing important questions and debates um, to have. And thank you, audience, for listening and for engaging and asking those difficult questions. Um, yeah, I'm left this seminar again. This is why I love chairing it, is I'm always left. I'm feeling a little bit edgy, Ross and Tracy, if I'm uh, honest, after this seminar, but, you know, I'm intellectually stimulated and engaged, and this is this is the whole point of the series. So I thank you so much for being a part of it. Um, before we let the audience go and everyone goes on their um, cheery Wednesday afternoon, Ross, I'm just going to leave final words for you if you have anything final you'd like to say. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, no one ever comes to talk to me if they wanted to hear anything cheery, unfortunately. <laughs> it's, it's the stall I've set out for myself as the nuclear power plants in war guy. Um, so, well, the last thing I'll say, I guess, is that what happens next with with this is going to be critical and one of the risks that we are, we're looking at at the moment in terms of research is um, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency's role is to verify that all nuclear materials in the world in civil use remain in civil use and aren't diverted to weapons purposes and they've kind of to this point stated that they will not do any work on that of that nature looking at um, occupied facilities where the, the material is out of the control of the state. Now, there's a question going to be raised, I think, quite soon, unless the situation changes of what is the greater risk to not verify that material and risk it falling into the wrong hands out of international oversight or to legitimize Russian control over this power plant through carrying out those inspections. Um, so this, this is something that has come up only in the last 24 hours really as, as something that we've been asked about so um, I'll, I guess I'll just leave that as, a, as the final thought of what is really the kind of the cutting edge of what's going on with uh, with the research at King's in this area yeah thank you very much and I uh, look forward to you know amplifying your research as it's produced in a material form as well too so thanks again Ross for sharing support work again thanks Tracy for coming and offering some really important um, expert reflections. And again, you, the audience, for asking those really important questions. So everyone have an afternoon. <laughs> everyone have an afternoon. <laughs> That's the best we can aim for at this point. <laughs> well, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, thank you, Amanda. Everyone. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you.